Good morning, church. Worthy is his name. He is our all in all. Those are big words. To be my all in all. That pretty well takes in everything, doesn't it? I want to start this morning with some good news. Last week, the Dodgers won their opening game. That's good news. The scary news is that one of them were interviewed right after the game. They said, well, we've got 161 more games. 161 more games in this season. There is no sports schedule that's more grueling than Major League Baseball. 161 more games all in the next few months. So they're going to be busy. But I want to introduce you to a baseball player. He's no longer playing baseball. But Adam LaRoche, you might remember that name. Adam was a son of David LaRoche, who was a Major League Baseball player. Adam grew up in Fort Scott, Kansas. He was, grew up in a Christian family, and it was just destiny that he and his brother would, like their father, play Major League Baseball. And they did. It was 2004 when Adam was drafted into the uh, Atlanta Braves, where he played he actually played for five teams during his career, but he accumulated 255 home runs. He got the Gold Glove Award. He was given the Silver Slugger Award. He received the National League Wilson Defensive Player of the Year Award. Adam LaRoche built quite a name, but among his teammates, what he was best known for was bringing his Christian principles to the game. Adam was the founder of Faith Day Baseball, which is still practiced in many stadiums across the country. He was passionate about his God and his religion, and he was passionate about mission. And he made dip many trips to Southeast Asia to, to help rescue young girls out of the slave trades. He was known as a man of prayer and high principles, the high Christian ideals. And he commonly took his son to all of his practices. He wanted his son there. But after a couple of years, the management of the White Sox came to him and said, hey, Adam, you can't bring your son to practice anymore. Nobody can. It wasn't just Adam. They didn't just single him out. But they said, children are lo no longer welcome here. You can't bring your children. Adam and his wife homeschooled their son because he felt very strongly that it was his job to raise his children. And so he only thought for about 15 minutes. And he turned around and walked back into the management office of the White Sox and tendered his resignation. He was about halfway through a $13 million contract. And he left about $6 million sitting on the table. Because he said, I have a duty to my son. And baseball is going to get in the way of that if I can't have him here. He was interviewed later. He said it broke his heart that he had to do that, but he had to choose his son over baseball. He said, I don't regret my decision. In just a few years, my children will be out doing their own things, and I don't want to look back with regret that I didn't do everything I could to prepare them well. Adam LaRouche understood that our children are precious gifts from God, and that there's we need to understand and look at them through that lens that they are not ours. They are on loan to us from God. But we've been given an awesome opportunity, an awesome responsibility to parent and to raise these children in the Lord. And he took that very seriously. It would be hard to walk away from that much money. There are all kinds of excuses we can make, wouldn't there be? Hey, it's only six more months. What's that going to make? What, what difference? I understand, they tell me this, that a child's basic personality and value system is formed by the time they're five years old. Think about that for a minute. A lot of us, when we look at these little kids, they're just little kids. No, they say by the time they're five, they have soaked up so much of who you are and your value system that that becomes the basis, the foundation 
from which they work the rest of their life. Does that mean you give up after five? No. <laughs> no. You continue to manage and, and guide and, and protect and, and fill in and build on that foundation. But it's amazing how much our children learn in just a few months. Adam LaRoche was aware of that. And he said, six months without my son is too much. Our children are, 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 are precious. But a lot of times they get pushed out of the way by the busyness of our schedules. There was a book written a few years ago called Tyranny of the Urgent. Anybody read that book? Tyranny of the Urgent. And what it, the premise was is that the things that scream at us, the things that say, I'm important, I'm important, take us away from the things that are truly important. They kind of sit in the background like maybe our children. Because the boss is saying, we've got a deadline, we've got to do this, you've got to do this, and if you don't do that, then you don't make your money, and then you don't have family, and then you don't have a host, house, home. I can't say those words. And what's important to you? And they, the urgent becomes the things that are important to us, and they rob us of the things that are truly important. And so today I want to share with you some things from Proverbs, some wisdom for parents as we try to raise our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. But understand, this isn't just for parents. It's for grandparents. It's for aunts. It's for uncles. It's for the church. It's for the community of God. A few years ago, Hillary Clinton wrote a book that she entitled, It Takes a Village. You remember that? I think in many ways, she's on track. It takes more than just me. It takes other people involved in the life of my children. It takes other people involved in my life to help sharpen me to be the person I need to be as a parent. It takes a village, but here's what we need to do is we need to pick our villages carefully because not all villages are the same. Some villages I don't want parenting my children. And we're going to talk some more about that. But I want you to know that this church here in Murrieta is committed to assisting parents to raise their children in the Lord. We want to raise godly children, and we only get one chance. I'd love to have some do-over sometime. Taylor Smith wished that she could have a do-over. You've all seen the video as she pushed her friend off of a bridge. She fell 60 feet into the water, broke several ribs, punctured both lungs. And Taylor wished that she could have had a do-over. She didn't mean to hurt her friend. But just a careless moment, a careless lack of thought injured her friend, injured their relationship, put her in the middle of a, a firestorm across the country. With our children, we don't get do-overs. We get one chance and they move on. That's what... Adam LaRoche understood. The central proverb to this idea of parenting comes out of chapter 22, verse 6, where it says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he was old, he will not depart from it. I want to share with you what that means, but I want you to understand, it's, we talked several weeks ago, that in the Proverbs, this is not a promise, it's an observation. It is the compressed wisdom of some of the most wise men in the world, in history, who sat down. They didn't sit down altogether, but we have the chance to sit down with them, to sit down at the table, to read their words, to take in their wisdom. And again, it's important to listen. The wisdom of others who've gone on before, especially when they're blessed by God, is worth us taking to heart and listening to. I've shared with you the importance of wisdom with some, some business people I know who paid a million dollars to sit down with Warren Buffett for one hour because they understood that the wisdom of somebody who'd gone before is precious. And so, let's sit at the feet of some of the wisest men in the world and hear what they have to say about parenting. We, just on that verse, before I move off of that, I just want to point out one thing I've pointed out before, that the verse does not say 
teach up your child. It says train up your child. And there's such a big difference, isn't there? When you have a teacher, it's one thing. When you have a trainer, it's a whole different situation. The trainer sits with you and takes you through the things. They teach you, the, they go with you, a, a, an instructor in an airplane, flight instructor. They go with you, and they hold the controls until you're good enough to hold them, and they, and they show you how to do it, and they show you, walk you through the whole, they train you through all these things. They didn't just sit in the classroom and say, this is what you need to do, now go do it. We'd have a lot of planes falling out of the sky. And sometimes we teach our children, you should do this, you should do that, and do this, do this, without walking through the whole process with them, hand in hand. And sometimes we have a lot of kids that are falling out of the cracks. So we teach our children. We train them in a lot of activities. We train them in school to do well, to listen carefully, to get their homework turned in, to do the things they need to do. We train them in sports. Oh, my goodness. All the training that goes into sports to help them to be good, to be competitive, to, to excel in things and maybe get a scholarship to college. We train for those. We train them in relationships, how to be friends, how to have friends. But the most important thing we should train them in is how to get A pluses in Jesus. If our children fail in Jesus... Jesus said it himself, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And what does it profit a man if his child becomes the CEO of a major corporation, but he doesn't know Jesus? If our children don't get A pluses in Jesus, then we have sold them short. So, how do we do this? A few principles from Proverbs on parenting. Number one, always... Always, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, always model for your children what you want them to become. It didn't say teach. It says model. It says be the person that they need to be. You be the person. Because doing what I say, not what I do, doesn't work with kids. And yet we're tempted to tell them, do what I say without becoming that person ourselves. So we want to model for them. We want to live for them in front of them and with them, the person we want them to become. Here's what the proverb says. Chapter 14, verse 26. He says, whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress. And for their children, it will be a refuge. Their children will flourish in the company of a secure fortress from somebody who fears God themselves. And so, parents, it has come back to me, back to us, back to you. Who am I in the face of God? Is, am I one person that my children would look at and say, here's what's most important to dad, here's what's most important to mom, that they honor and they praise the Lord. People argue about Christmas and Santa Claus and what they should tell their children about that. And about Easter and all these things, and they're afraid if we tell them something, they might think later that we told them a lie. And if we lie about that, we're probably lying about God too. That's such a bizarre argument to me. I don't know for you, we grew up with all, we played all the games, all the fantasies, all the, th and we, am I saying too much? It is. It was so rich, but there was never a moment in our lives, in my family growing up, that we didn't know absolutely sure what was its life. They lived what they believed. They played the games. They had the fantasy. They enjoyed the, the life, and we had a great time together. But there was never a question of what was real in their life because they lived it daily. It wasn't just on Sundays when they went to church. And so we as children knew what was purposeful, what was valuable, what was real, what was true, because they modeled it before us. I was blessed in that way to watch my parents love God. 
And so, parents, model for your kids the ones, the things you want them to become. A faith observed is a lot more convincing than a faith proclaimed. In other words, talk is cheap. But what we do makes a difference. Chapter uh, 20, verse 7. The, the psalmist says, the righteous lead blameless lives, and blessed are their children after them. The righteous, the ones who are going to bless their children, are the ones who take God's word to heart, and they live blameless lives. We read that psalm this morning, Psalm 15. Who can approach God's holy mountain? He says, the ones who are blameless. The ones who lift holy hands before me. The ones who do what I say, not just give assent to it. The ones who give their hearts who make me the Lord of their lives, who follow, they're the ones. Does that mean we have to be perfect? Well, we're all in trouble if that's the case. But we need to be intentional, on purpose. And when we fail, to be able to admit that and tell the truth about the things that we are and the things we aren't. And not to accept the fact that I'm not perfect but rather to aspire and try to be modeling perfection. But being merciful and gracious enough to accept less. Does that make sense? I don't want to lower the bar. I don't want to lower my standards. I don't want to lower God's standards. But I don't want to aim for less than God's standards. He says, Proverbs 30, he says, every word of God is flawless. He is a refuge in him. And I want to say this just because I'm afraid that some, not some place, a lot of places in our Christian culture today, we are second guessing the word of God. And even in some churches, the message proclaimed that it is more centered around God. And we twist and we take things, we take things out of context and we try to make God's word after our own image instead of the other way around. He says, every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. And when our children see us take the word of God seriously, they learn to take the word of God seriously. People are trying to get around God's ways today. They're trying to make God fit our culture instead of our culture fitting God. God sends us into the world to be salt and light in a world that is dark. And he didn't just send that to us today. He sent it to a world. Jesus spoke those words in a culture that was anti-Christian, if anything. He said, you go out and be light and salt. You take my words seriously and you represent it well, and your children will watch you, and they will follow after you. They will imitate you. I've heard preachers say, well, Paul missed it on this, and Paul was wrong over here, and Paul was wrong over there. And that just makes me so nervous when people say, the Bible's not trustworthy. When it's preached sometimes in our pulpits, the Bible is not trustworthy anymore. It was written long ago. Heard an interview with a Christian couple pastoring a huge church up in Chicago. And they said, if we could get away from the advice of a book that was written over 2,000 years ago, we'd be good. I would say, what? <laughs> what? Why do you even exist if, you, if you're not going to accept what the Word of God says? When there's a teaching in the Bible... I, I want you to understand, there's all kinds of room for questioning the text. There's all kinds of room for questioning translational situations. There are things that I don't understand. But here's what I do, and I don't, I'll, I'll recommend this to you. When I see something in the Word that I don't understand or I don't agree with, I assume that I am wrong and the Word is right. When I set myself up above God and I start making excuses, guess who's watching me? My children, your children, 
are watching me, I will assume that I'm wrong. And I'll follow the word of God with everything I can. So number one, parents, model before your children what you want them to become. And value God. Number two, many of our teens believe that love is conditional. And parents, I want you to know our, your teens live in a subculture that you don't know about. They have friends who say things that they don't always come home and tell you about. They have people in their circles as they're going through life who they're not always ready to tell you what they're doing. Now, that wasn't my case with my children, was it? You guys told us everything, didn't you? No, I, I promise. I promise. There are things my parents don't know that I did. And they probably never will. And if you tell them, we're going to have a discussion. But there are things, they live in a situation where there's a certain amount of fear. If my parents found out about this, they would kill me. Or they would think less. This is what I was just mentioning earlier. We need in our homes to create an atmosphere of high moral standards and yet an atmosphere of grace and mercy where the fear is taken away. John wrote, he said, perfect love casts out all fear when I know that I'm loved regardless. When I know that, then the fear is gone. And I can approach Jesus that way. And our children need to approach us that way. Number three, we need to practice God-like discipline. That's a hard word to say. Because who likes discipline? The Hebrew writer writes, says nobody likes discipline. He said it. Nobody likes it. But it shapes us to be the people we need to be. Here's what the proverb says in chapter 3. He says, my son... Do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. He says, God disciplines you just like a loving father does. The Hebrew writer says a father that doesn't discipline his children does not love his children. He loves himself and he loves his ease more than he loves his kids. Discipline, the Proverbs talks about discipline a lot. There are a lot of passages about discipline. But it is the sign of a parent who loves their children. Discipline is hard. No one wants to do that work. We'd rather play games. We'd rather have a good time. We'd rather eat ice cream. We'd, we'd rather do a lot of things we'd rather do than discipline. That's the hard work of being a parent. Chapter 13, verse 24 he says, whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. And I want you to understand, he's not talking about getting out a big broomstick and whacking your kids. He's not talking about abuse. Okay? He's talking about discipline. And sometimes discipline is hard. But it's vital. And it takes time. And it takes energy to raise them be godly because you know our basic instinct is selfish isn't it we basically we learn to take care of ourselves babies from the time they're born they are the most selfish creatures in the world aren't they if they don't get the things they want what do they do they scream bloody murder they put you in your place you're jumping and you're hopping to meet all of their needs and they'll make you suffer if you don't they are the most selfish creatures you will ever lay eyes on. And we have to be trained out of that because that's our natural situation. So we need to be disciplined to be the people God has called us to be. Not natural people, but supernatural people. Not ordinary people, but extraordinary people. Godly people. Number four, I want you to know, not every village... As we mentioned before, not every village is safe. There are villages out there who want your children. They want your children to be a part of that village. But they don't care about your children. 
They don't care about their godliness. They don't care about their lives. They care about a bottom line. They care about profit. They care about whatever money they can make off of your children. And so they are out, not for the benefit of your children, but for their own selfish interests. Media, songs, music, movies, all that influence that pours into our lives, we need to choose carefully the villages that we let our children be a part of. I loved it when my children were very young and we could choose their friends. That was a great time. We'd plan play dates. We'd have great times. We'd invite who we wanted to. But you know what? They grow up. And then they start inviting other people. And who do they invite? Hopefully they invite the people that you've trained them to associate with because we become like those that we hang out with. We, it's no, we can't help but. We rub off on each other. And so what villages that we allow our children to be part of. I was listening to one woman talk. She said, there is no First Amendment in my house. She said, I'm sorry. My kids all have cell phones, and I know their passwords, and I can take the cell phone, give it to me, check in everything. But mom, but mom, but mom, mom, mom. says, what? They, who paid for that cell phone? Well, I guess you did. That's right. And checking all the emails, all the tests, all the Instagrams, all the stuff. Who, who are we talking to? What, what kind of village are we hanging around with? Because the village we hang around with is the village we become. And so not every village is safe. So watch out and look for your kids. The writer of Proverbs says in chapter 1, he says, My son, if sinful men entice you, do not give in to them. Run away. If there is something that looks good but is not godly, don't look at it. Don't focus on it. Turn around and run away. Say no to ungodly influences. Say no to the village that's not out for your good. And be wise enough to know the difference between a worldly view and a godly view. And help our children to get a godly world view. To see everything through the lens of godliness, of God's will. Because it's so easy to put on this worldview that the world has of it's about me and it's about my fun, it's about my pleasure, it's about feeling good, it's about fulfilling myself. But a godly worldview says it's about honoring Christ, being his ambassador, not your own. But that takes intention, parents, doesn't it? It takes time. It takes sitting down with a husband and wife and saying, how are we going to do this for our children? And making a plan. It takes doing things on purpose. And lastly, I want you to just encourage you to live joyful lives in front of your children. Live life of the, the joy of the Spirit, one. Rejoice in God's presence. Give Him thanks all the time. And don't walk around grumbly. I've seen so many children walk away from the Lord because every Sunday after church, they'd sit down and listen to their parents complain about church and complain about the people at church. And they'd walk away and they'd tell me later, what do I want to do with that? My parents didn't like it. I don't like it either. Parents, live joyful lives. Live lives of gratitude before your children. Let them see the life of Christ and the joy of Christ. This chapter 22, 23. He says, may your father and mother rejoice. May she who gave you birth be joyful. He's talking about children who walk in the Lord who help their parents be grateful. But parents, we need to teach our children first. How to be gracious and grateful and joyful in the Lord. They say that laughter is the best medicine. And I think maybe that's true. I thank God for Julie, my wife. She laughs much more than I do. She just comes by her 
much more naturally than I do. Somebody said once that a child laughs about 300 times a day and an adult laughs about three times. And what, what happens to us? We get so bound up in some of the worries of the world that we forget to enjoy life. And God has given us a great life. He's given us great promises. He has loved us. He has called us our ch his children. He has given us the promises of eternal life. We have much to celebrate, don't we? Will there be problems in the world? Absolutely. Will we get all bent out of shape when we hear the Mueller report mentioned over and over again? We have great joy. Let's live that way in front of our children. I want you to know, parents, that this church is committed to helping you. And to be godly parents, there are resources available to you through this church. We have Garrett who led her singing. He is our youth minister. Valuable source of resources and ideas on how to be godly parents and to, to help your kids get A pluses in Jesus. We have our, our children's ministry leaders, Julie, my wife, Rebecca Moonen, who are anxious to help our children to know the Lord and help you to help your children to know the Lord and get A pluses in Jesus. We have resources available to you. Ask. Seek. <laughs> Bring your children to be a part of it. It does take a village. And this is a village that's healthy for your children to get to know the Lord. So we want to invite you to do that. We want to invite you to know the Lord yourself if you don't already. If you've never surrendered yourself to Christ. You don't know the joy of being called his child and the promise of eternity with him. None of us deserve to be called his children. But God paid a great price in letting his son die in our place. So if you can, if you're ready to give your life to Christ, we're ready to help you with that today. If you want to be a better parent, we're ready to help you with that today. And you can come down here and say, help me and let us minister to you while we stand and sing this song.